Good evening, uh, everyone, or good afternoon from the UK. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Evans, and I am a diabetologist based here in Cardiff in the UK. Uh, and it's really with great pleasure that I welcome you to this third year of the Mentor-Mentee program. Uh, and I think this has been extremely successful over the last couple of years. And the objective here really is around increasing our understanding and knowledge of the management of diabetes uh, and through the process of uh, sharing best practice, sharing information, understanding current updates in the field of diabetes, which of course is, as always, rapidly evolving in terms of the evidence uh, and the science. And as a mentor this year, I really look forward to some fruitful interactions discussions, debate, uh, and uh, sharing of some really exciting updates uh, over the next year or so. So with that, I'd like to just start off with effectively our first lecture of the uh, program this year. Uh, and in connection really with the theme of updates and the rapidly evolving evidence base that surrounds diabetes and the therapeutics within diabetes, we felt it would be a fitting place to start to think about the SGLT2 inhibitors and their role in treating people with diabetes and the evolving indications for this class of drugs, in fact, beyond people with diabetes. So for the next 30 minutes or so, that's really what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to look at some of the current data and also very briefly mention some studies that we will expect to see presenting findings over the next 12 to 18 months or so that will undoubtedly form part of our ongoing learning activities and discussions. So we'll start off by just reminding ourselves that SGLT2 inhibitors started off life as a very promising class of drugs for the management of people with type 2 diabetes. And across the class of agents, including empagliflozin, canagliflozin, DAPA, and ertugliflozin, these agents have been shown to produce fairly meaningful reductions in HbA1c of approaching 1%, reductions in body weight of between 2 to 3.5 kilograms, depending upon the background medication, reductions in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Therefore, as treatments for the metabolic abnormalities of type 2 diabetes, the SGLT2 inhibitors are widely uh, perceived as very good treatment options. And in terms of uh, their value for money, in a UK healthcare setting, SGLT2 inhibitors are considered, from the perspective of these data, to represent cost-effective, good-value treatment options. However, over the years since the initial availability of the SGLT2 inhibitors back around 2012, we, as you know, have had a plethora of outcome data published which have gone on to inform multiple international and national guidelines around the positioning of this class of drugs within the treatment paradigm for type 2 diabetes. As we know, we have seen consistent outcome benefits in relation to the SGLT2 inhibitors, with reduction in heart failure hospitalization, reduction in three-point MACE, and with empagliflozin in the EMPA-REG study in type 2 diabetes, we saw a reduction both in all-cause mortality and indeed in cardiovascular death. And as such, empagliflozin remains the only oral agent that has, in a cardiovascular safety study, demonstrated mortality outcome benefits. So in terms of treating type 2 diabetes, these agents are very well accepted and have a uh, plethora of guidelines supporting their position within the treatment paradigm. Yet, despite all of this evidence, we are seeing a significant amount of clinical inertia or therapy inertia with respect to their use in routine practice. Data from the DISCOVER study presented at the ADA demonstrated that in people who would benefit from an SGLT2 inhibitor according to guidelines, such as those with established cardiovascular disease, at risk of cardiovascular disease with established heart failure, or at risk of chronic kidney disease or with established CKD, only around 16% of people were actually being prescribed an SGLT2 inhibitor, despite all of the outcome evidence that we'll now briefly review. So I think there is definitely a need for a call to action in terms of our prescribing and our use of these agents to ensure more people are being exposed to the potential benefits of these drugs.
Now, we have a variety of outcome studies, which I'll cover very briefly in type 2 diabetes. We have the DECLARE study, CANVAS, EMPEREG, and the Virtus CV study. And we also have uh, SOLOIST and SCORED with a combined SGLT2, SGLT1 inhibitor, sotagliflozin. And I will cover the data from that study, those two studies, a little bit later on. The DECLARE study it is thought to really represent the most um, uh, generalizable patient population including people with both established cardiovascular disease and risk factors for cardiovascular disease and is thought to be representative of up to 60 percent of the type 2 diabetes patient population globally. The EMPA-REG study was the first and uh, real landmark trial in terms of our understanding of SGLT2 inhibitor potential benefits and included almost exclusively people with established cardiovascular disease. In terms of the CV outcomes, as I mentioned very briefly earlier on, what we have seen is a consistent benefit of around 30 to 35 percent in terms of a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, reductions that were statistically significant in terms of three-point MACE, namely non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, CV death, as a composite in the EMPA-REG and CANVAS program with numerical reductions in declare TIMI. Uh, and slightly less in the way of the Virtus CV study, which interestingly enough was a very similar study designed to the Empereg study. But as I also mentioned earlier on, it is only within the Empereg study with empagliflozin that we have seen a statistically significant reduction in CV death and indeed all-cause mortality. Guidelines, as I've said, have uh, accepted and taken these uh, data to heart and position the SGLT2 inhibitors as a preferred second-line treatment option and potentially even as a first-line treatment option in people considered at high risk of heart failure, with established heart failure, with high risk of cardiovascular disease, or established uh, cardiovascular disease. Also in people with chronic kidney disease or progressive kidney disease based on the outcomes from these studies in which there have been a consistent benefit with respect to delaying the progression of decline in GFR and reduction in albuminuria, SGLT2 inhibitors are also mandated or supported by international guidelines, as illustrated here by the ADA EASD recommendation. Now, there are many commonalities between cardiovascular, renal, and metabolic disease. Uh, and people with type 2 diabetes are between two to five times more likely to develop heart failure. Furthermore, about 50% of people with uh, CKD will also have concomitant heart failure. And there is certainly an overlap between the uh, sort of clustering of cardio-renal metabolic disease. And this is supported by our understanding of the pathophysiology of these conditions. Indeed, cardiovascular damage, heart failure, and kidney failure are integrally linked by multiple mechanisms related to high hyperglycemia as illustrated here. Hyperglycemia is associated with multiple uh, metabolic effects including pro-inflammatory uh, and atherosclerotic uh, processes that can impair cardiac function driving heart failure. Furthermore, hyperfiltration, activation of the renin-angiotensin system can also drive glomerulin sclerosis which forms the key early step in the process of kidney disease in diabetes. We're also seeing an effect of hyperglycemia on increasing liver uh, fat deposition and increasing insulin resistance and increasing hepatic uh, inflammatory cytokine production. And interestingly, data from the EMPA-REG study has demonstrated that the use of empagliflozin has been shown to reduce indices of hepatic fat, hepatic fibrosis, and therefore provides an interesting and tantalizing prospect for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors as illustrated by the empagliflozin data in the management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or so-called NASH which is the leading cause actually globally of hepatic failure ahead of uh, alcohol related uh, liver problems. So there is a commonality of pathophysiology which lends itself to this cluster of clinical phenotype of cardiorenal metabolic disease. Now, SGLT2 inhibition uh, impacts upon the renin-angiotensin system, and the uh, use of these agents, RAS inhibition and SGLT2 inhibitors, have a synergistic effect. SGLT2 inhibition causes afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction and efferent arteriolar vasodilatation.
This is consequent upon this effect on renal tubular glomerular feedback. And as a consequence of this, what we see is a reduction in glomerular filtration pressure and thereby a reduction in the potential for glomerular sclerosis, glomerular injury, and kidney damage. Now, in terms of the studies that have been conducted, there have been a variety of studies which have reflected people with type 2 diabetes, CKD, and heart failure, and there are indeed ongoing studies. In type 2 diabetes, we've covered the data already. In terms of CKD, we have the Credence, DAPA CKD, SCORED, and the ongoing, soon-to-be-reported EMPA kidney study. In terms of heart failure, we have DAPA HF, EMPA reduced and EMPA preserved, the DELIVER study, again, people with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction, and the SOLOIST study with sotagliflozin. We also have a lot of other ongoing studies, which I'll mention very briefly right now. In particular, we have several very interesting empagliflozin studies. We have impact mi which is a study looking at the use of empagliflozin in people with type 2 diabetes following a myocardial infarction. We also have the EMPRESS study, which is looking at the use of empagliflozin in people with acute decompensated heart failure. We also, uh, in terms of empagliflozin data, have the EMPRA preserved study, which is very imminently due to report and will be the first of the studies using SGLT2 inhibitors in people with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction heart failure, which is actually very common in type 2 diabetes. Uh, and I'm really interested to see the results of this study. Uh, and knowing what we know about the mechanism of action, I would be very surprised if we don't see a significant outcome benefit reported in this trial. But in terms of the mechanism of action linking SGLT2 inhibitors to diabetes, to cardiovascular disease, to kidney disease, there are many effects that SGLT2 inhibitors have which are beneficial across the disease spectrum. SGLT2 inhibitors result in a naturesis and therefore a reduction in sodium retention, have a potential to reduce volume, uh, impact on RAS activation and through this tubular glomerular feedback by reducing sodium and glucose delivery to the periglomerular macula densa, reduce periglomerular renin-angiotensin system activation. There is also a reduction in neurohormonal activation, inflammation, ischemia and preferential energetic utilization such that cardiac muscle and renal tissue tends to use free fatty acids more preferentially when people are on an SGLT2 inhibitor, thereby increasing efficiency metabolically of these tissues and potentially contributing to the outcome benefits that we are seeing. In terms of heart failure, just a couple of quick words on this. Heart failure currently can be subdivided into either HEFREF or HEFPEF. HEFREF is basically heart failure where you have reduced ejection fraction, typically less than 40% on an echo. HEFPEF is where you have the symptoms and signs of heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction of 40% or greater. Um, in terms of heart failure and diabetes, it is a very important complication. It is, in fact, uh, one of the first manifestations of cardiovascular disease in many people with diabetes. 14%, in fact, of folks with diabetes will present with heart failure as their earliest manifestation of cardiovascular disease. It's frequent. About a third of people with diabetes will have evidence of heart failure. And uh, being aware of this association is actually quite important in terms uh, of our clinical practice. Many people with diabetes will present with indolent features which may be um, uh, in keeping with heart failure, uh, such as tiredness, breathlessness, mild ankle edema, and checking a BNP is extremely useful. Obesity, DPP-4 inhibitors will all drive up the BNP whereas being on an ACE inhibitor will reduce your BNP level, as will being on a diuretic. Therefore, our approach is that if you have a natural, uh, an anti-pro-BNP level of over 400, this would be highly suggestive of having heart failure. As such, there is often an underdiagnosis of heart failure in people with diabetes. Similarly, there is also a, a lot of diabetes present in people with um, heart failure. Furthermore, if you have diabetes and heart failure, there's near a doubling of mortality associated with these comorbidities. Now, COVID-19 is something that's affected us all, and sadly, particularly true in India, and we've seen the Delta variant spread, such that the Delta variant now accounts for about 98% of cases here in the UK. 
uh, and looking at some of the modeling data that we have, we're expecting around 18 million cases of COVID-19 by the end of this year. But it has resulted in an increase in the complexity of managing people with diabetes. There's about 45,000 missed or delayed type 2 diabetes diagnoses as of August 2020 in the UK. There's a very significant reduction, 77 to 84% in terms of rates of HbA1c. And there is a very significant increase in mortality uh, in people with type 2 diabetes outside of the mortality associated with COVID seen during the course of the pandemic. So let's look at some of the studies that we now have for uh, the uh, role of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in people outside of diabetes, because we're talking beyond the diabetes today. So what we have here is the DAPA-HF study. This was a study of dapagliflozin uh, on top of standard of care compared to placebo in people with established heart failure with a primary composite of CV death or worsening of heart failure. And what was seen in this study over a median duration of 24 months was a 26% uh, relative risk reduction and a near 5% absolute risk reduction in this composite of CV death or worsening heart failure with outcome benefits being seen as early as three months within treatment exposure. In fact, within 28 days of treatment exposure, evidence of outcome benefit in favor of the SGLT2 inhibitor was seen with an NNT here of only 21. Breaking down these individual component parts, there was a benefit in terms of both CV death independently as well as worsening of heart failure. Within the DAPA-HF study, there were subgroups of people with and without type 2 diabetes. And irrespective of your diabetes status, the benefit in terms of the composite endpoint was still seen with the NNTs of 23 in those without type 2 diabetes and even lower of 19 in those with type 2 diabetes and established heart failure. So you can clearly see a role for the SGLT2 inhibitors from the perspective of mitigating heart failure morbidity and also mortality in people with type 2 diabetes. There was also evidence from the DAPA-HF study of a uh, benefit in terms of renal function and there was a 29% relative risk reduction of around a 0.5% absolute risk reduction in uh, a renal composite defined as a 50% sustained decline in GFR, development of end-stage renal disease, or renal death. Uh, All-cause mortality was also reduced by 17% with a 2.3% absolute risk reduction, with evidence of benefit becoming apparent within 9 to 12 months of randomization. Uh, in addition, uh, part of the study included a symptom uh, analysis by means of the validated Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, the so-called KCCQ score, and this was statistically significant uh, at eight months with evidence of a five-point or greater improvement in those patients receiving uh, dapagliflozin. Now, the Emperor-Gliflozin study was the Emperor-Reduce study, and this again included an SGLT2 inhibitor in the form of Empagliflozin. Patients were randomized to 10 milligrams a day of empagliflozin or placebo uh, in the context of established heart failure with a composite primary endpoint here being time to first event of adjudicated CV death or adjudicated heart failure hospitalization with a variety of secondary events including first and recurrent adjudicated heart failure events and also renal outcomes in terms of EGFR slope and change from baseline. This is based around specific hierarchical outcome testing, which is something that's quite frequently done and lends quite a lot of strength and validity to the results when we come to interpret their importance in respect to clinical practice. Primary endpoint here, as I said, was the adjudication of CV death, heart failure hospitalization, uh, and secondary events here were key uh, uh, secondary events, as we've talked about, adjudicated first and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations and change in GFR. With respect to these outcomes, there was a 25% reduction in that primary endpoint of a first adjudicated uh, CV death or indeed heart failure hospitalization with an NNT very favorable of only 19 
25% relative risk reduction and an absolute risk reduction of 5.2%. So very favorable data, uh, and if anything, slightly more favorable than the DAPA HF study, but certainly in line with what was seen with the DAPA HF study with respect to these numbers. And these NNTs underpin the value of empagliflozin from this perspective. And this study included, as did the DAPA HF study, people with both with and without type 2 diabetes. In terms of some of the key secondary endpoints, these are data around adjudicated total hospitalizations for heart failure, both first and recurrent, and we see a significant 30% relative risk reduction in favor of those people treated with empagliflozin, with evidence of outcome benefit in terms of total hospitalization burden becoming apparent with, again within three to six months of treatment randomization. Importantly, another endpoint is the change in GFR from baseline, and in favor of empagliflozin here, what you see is a reduction initially in terms of the GFR level, and subsequent to that, there is stabilizing off of that GFR slope compared to placebo. So in essence, what this translates into is a, a GFR that is uh, in favor of being on empagliflozin in the region of around three and a half mils per 1.73 meters squared after about two and a half years of treatment. So there is this renoprotective effect which forms part of the a priori hypothesis looking at the potential role of empagliflozin in people with and without type 2 diabetes uh, in terms of chronic kidney disease outcomes which is the uh, uh, emphasis of the EMPA kidney study and that will include patients down to a GFR of just over 20. So we will be really interested to see what happens from that perspective. But based on what we already know, it's highly likely that this will be a very positive outcome study. And when we look at why that may be the case, this is the GFR slope. And you'll see here in the sort of orange line that the GFR slope is flattened with empagliflozin compared to the natural decline that you see with um, uh, uh, non-SGLT2 inhibitor-based therapy. So when we look here at the top-line efficacy results, we see benefit for empagliflozin in terms of the primary endpoint, key secondary endpoints such as heart failure hospitalization, and key secondary endpoints in terms of the decline in GFR slope. So very significant benefits supporting the potential role going beyond type 2 diabetes and in people with heart failure. When we look at uh, some other composite renal endpoints in this study, this is the composite of end-stage kidney disease and a sustained profound decrease in GFR of greater than 40%. And what this was uh, showing us is a 50% relative risk reduction, 1.5% absolute risk reduction in favor of empagliflozin, with these renal outcome benefits again becoming apparent within a very short time following randomization, namely around three to six months. When we look at some individual component parts of the primary endpoint, uh, we see a very significant reduction in first hospitalization for heart failure, which is very important because subsequent to first hospitalizations for heart failure, then what we get is a very significant increase in the costs associated uh, with that condition. Uh, also, what we see is a very significant increase in morbidity associated uh, with heart failure in people um, who are subsequently hospitalized. Cardiovascular death was also modestly reduced uh, in favor of empagliflozin. Uh, so we are seeing heart failure benefits very profound, in fact, both in terms of first and recurrent heart failure outcomes with empagliflozin. KCCQ score also was part of the EMPA-reduced EMPA study, uh, and uh, this included, as I said, people with reduced ejection fraction heart failure with a baseline uh, pro-BNP fairly elevated at nearly 1,700, so a fairly advanced cohort of people with heart failure. And this KCCQ score, as a measure of symptoms, was significantly improved on empagliflozin uh, at 12 months and remained improved while people were on treatment. So not only does uh, treatment with empagliflozin as part of the emperor reduced study produce symptom improvement, but you uh, have maintained symptom improvement when you're on treatment.
In terms of some of the outcomes uh, from uh, the studies that were seen with respect to safety, looking at the DAPA HF study, uh, a very well described safety and tolerability profile. Renal adverse events were fewer, no signs of amputation, numerically low rate of diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, no evidence of an increase actually in complex urinary tract infection, with numerically slightly more in the way of volume depletion uh, side effects. And this safety profile is also something that was actually uh, reflected in the EMPRA reduced study with um, no signal in terms of amputation, uh, numerically fewer acute kidney injury events in favor of embagliflozin, uh, and uh, only a small numerical excess of volume depletion side effects. So when using an SGLT2 inhibitor, I think in people with heart failure, there is no need for routine safety monitoring from the perspective of renal function, uh, but I think what we would be doing is, as we would in all patients with heart failure, is monitoring their uh, volume status. Moving on to sotagliflozin, uh, the sotagliflozin uh, data is based around this molecule, which is a dual SGLT1 and SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, SGLT1 is a primary transporter, transporter and absorbs for absorption of glucose and galactose in the GI tract. Pharmacological inhibition by sotagliflozin is independent of insulin and doesn't actually depend on glucose uh, on kidney function. And the potential effects um, uh, are based around reducing glucose, but with a side effect that may include GI upset. The SGLT2 inhibitor component of sotagliflozin works just the same as, say, dapagliflozin or empagliflozin would in terms of inhibiting renal glucose reabsorption uh, at the proximal part of the convoluted tubule, thereby re resulting in a naturesis and a, um, uh, a, a, a urinary glucose excretion and resulting in reduction of periglomerular renin-angiotensin system activation. Now, in terms of uh, where we stand, as I've already talked about, we have these studies with uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, but where the soloist study is slightly different is you have people with and without diabetes who have uh, established uh, heart failure. Uh, and the soloist WHF um, study is slightly different in that what this does, this addressed and looked at people in a vulnerable period following a heart failure admission or worsening heart failure. So this study looked at people who were just about either decompensated or recovering from a hospitalization with uh, heart failure as a consequence of reduced ejection fraction. The key inclusion criteria here were admission with signs and symptoms of decompensated heart failure, treatment necessitating intravenous diuretics, subsequent stabilization uh, and transitioning from IV diuretics onto oral diuretics with an elevated pro-BNP and in this study established type 2 diabetes. In terms of baseline characteristics we'll see here mean age of around 70, predominance of males, uh, global distribution, LV ejection fraction of 35%, pro-BNP in the region of the sort of thing that was seen in the Emperor, uh, Emperor Reduce study of around 1800 with a lot of people, as you would imagine, on maximized anti-heart failure medication, with over 90% receiving any RAS inhibitor. Primary efficacy here was total CV death, heart failure hospitalization, or urgent heart failure visit. Uh, and this was seen to be very uh, positive in favor of uh, sotagliflozin, with outcome benefit being seen within, really, a few weeks of treatment randomization. In fact, significant statistically was seen within 28 days uh, of this 39% relative risk reduction, the p-value less than 0.05. Now, the SCORED study is the renal outcome study with sotagliflozin, uh, and the key inclusion criteria here were type 2 diabetes, HbA1c of greater than 7, GFR of 25 to 60 with established cardiovascular risk factors, exclusion being the use of any other SGLT2 inhibitor. Reduction in HbA1c uh, across uh, the um, study was uh, seen in people with both moderate and indeed severe EGFR categories, with HbA1c reduction with sotagliflozin 
greater than that of placebo in the region of about 0.7% from baseline. Now, looking at some of the CKD study outcomes, I'm just going to touch on a little bit of these before we finish. We've uh, discussed already the diabetes studies, and this included people with type 2 diabetes with uh, fairly modest uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. The Creedence study was a little bit more advanced. DAPA CKD and SCORED had more people with advanced kidney disease. And as I've mentioned, the EMPA kidney study is the study looking at people probably with the most advanced chronic kidney disease. In terms of the Creedence study, this is the first of the SGLT2 studies uh, looking at renal uh, outcomes. And this is just over 4,500 people with type 2 diabetes albumin to creatinine ratio of greater than 300 milligrams per gram with an average GFR of uh, 57 with an uh, average UACR of 927 milligram per gram. Uh, people needed to be on stable background RAS inhibition and in terms of the primary outcome there was a 30% relative risk in that composite of doubling of serum creatinine end stage kidney disease uh, or cardiovascular death with an NNT of 21. In terms of progression to end-stage kidney disease, there was a 32% relative risk reduction with an NNT of 42. With respect to amputations, there appeared to be no significant excess risk of amputations or indeed uh, bone fractures with canaglyphosin seen in this particular study. Now, the DAPA CKD study was a, another renal outcome study. And this other population represented the patients of the, that we would see in routine clinical practice. 32% had type 2 diabetes, 60% did not have type 2 diabetes. GFR of 25 to 75, UACR of between 200 and 500 milligrams per gram. 96% were hypertensive and virtually all were on an ACE inhibitor or a renin angiotensin system blocker. In terms of the outcomes from this study, what we saw in, with respect to that composite of uh, declining kidney function, end-stage kidney disease, renal or CV death, was a 39% relative risk reduction, 5.3% absolute risk reduction, and an NNT of 19. Looking at some of the individual component parts, uh, this was some subgroup data looking at the cohort of folks with type 2 diabetes. Similar 36% relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction of 5.3% uh, and an NNT of 19. When we look at some other exploratory uh, endpoints, namely those without type 2 diabetes, we saw actually, interestingly, very similar reductions in terms of that com composite endpoint of kidney disease, uh, CV, death, etc. Also, we saw reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization across the study with a uh, reduction of 29%, translating into a 1.8% absolute risk reduction. And similarly, as we've seen indeed with all of the SGLT2 inhibitor outcome studies, benefits becoming apparent very early on within treatment randomization. So currently, certainly in the UK, DAPA-CKD is the first of the studies that we've seen uh, presenting outcome evidence. Uh, but the positioning of the DAPA-CKD study is slightly earlier in terms of the natural history of kidney disease than we will see with the EMPA kidney trial, which I think will add further insights into the benefits and roles of an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, beyond uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, in terms of the safety and tolerability profile in the DAPA-CKD study, very similar to that uh, seen across other studies in terms of volume depletion, slightly, slightly more in the way of uh, volume depletion issues, but otherwise no significant uh, adverse safety signal seen. And indeed, as we've seen with the EMPA-REG study, with the EMPA-REDUCE study, uh, and all of the SGLT2 inhibitor studies, including Credence, a reduction in acute kidney injury and no sign of an increase in urinary tract infections. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, what we've talked about over the last 30 minutes or so is the evolving evidence base for SGLT2 inhibitors beyond type 2 diabetes. And in particular, there's a major focus on heart failure and kidney disease outcomes, and there are several ongoing studies which will further enhance our knowledge around the use of these agents in these indications.
And I think we really eagerly await the results of studies like MPACT, MI, MPRESS, and EMPA-Kidney, looking at the roles of empagliflozin specifically in even more advanced patients in terms of the natural history of disease than we have currently in terms of the evidence base. This is, however, a rapidly evolving area, and I'm sure this will form a significant part of our discussions and educational activities ongoing. Uh, and soon there will be many more label indications for SGLT2 inhibitors beyond type 2 diabetes. And I think it's a really remarkable area to be in. This is the first time, certainly in my experience, that we have a drug that started off life for treating glucose in people with diabetes that has now extended evidence of outcome benefit into other disease areas like kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, and heart failure. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So the first question that we have is, can EMPA and LINA combination safe in nephritic patients? The answer to that, I think, is yes, it can be. Um, in terms of the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor, if you are using an SGLT2 inhibitor to reduce blood glucose, you would need to have a GFR uh, of 45 or above to produce a significant reduction in blood glucose. Linagliptin can be used uh, and produce blood glucose reductions right the way down, in fact, to end-stage renal disease. The outcome benefits seen with dapagliflozin and indeed with empagliflozin in the emperor reduced study were seen independent of GFR and were seen across uh, subgroup uh, levels of GFR ranging from over 60 uh, right the way down to 30 and below. Uh, don't, so the next question comes from, don't, don't you feel that post-EMPRA uh, HEFPEF top-line result empagliflozin is a class apart among the SGLT2 inhibitors? Well, it's a really interesting question, uh, and I think what we will uh, have to look at is the result. Uh, certainly what you have with empagliflozin at the moment is a massive uh, research program that will really add to our understanding of the role of uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And I think the results of EMPA kidney, the results of MPACT MI, MPRESS, uh, and uh, EMPRA preserved will provide further insights in terms of the, the utility of empagliflozin in treating type 2 diabetes. Do you see any role for SGLT2 inhibitor in retinopathy and neuropathy? Well, really only from the perspective of managing diabetes and reducing blood glucose levels with a reduced risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, from the microvascular disease perspective. Uh, is it safe for patients with compensated chronic liver disease and NAFLD? Well, interestingly enough, the SGLT2 inhibitors certainly reduce fatty liver, and we're using SGLT2 inhibitors in combination with uh, a GLP-1 receptor agonist to reduce hepatic fat content. And there was some data presented both at the ADA and the ACE meeting uh, looking at the effects of semaglutide, uh, in the treatment of hepatic steatosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, and there is an ongoing research program with that particular molecule. So I think where we will see uh, SGLT2 inhibitors going potentially uh, in the future is in the management of hepatic steatosis. Cut off GFR for use of SGLT2 inhibitors. So the current label indication for management of glucose is a GFR of 45. However, uh, at the, uh, uh, based on the DAPA-CKD and DAPA-HF studies, you can use dapagliflozin down to a GFR of 30 uh, and potentially below, although experience below 30 is fairly limited. Based on the results of the EMPRA reduced study, it's likely, I would think, that the empagliflozin label indication in terms of heart failure will be down to a GFR of 25. Uh, and you can use an SGLT2 inhibitor irrespective of baseline GFR from the perspective of cardiovascular and heart failure uh, and kidney disease risk mitigation. Uh, the GFR of 45 is really only there in terms of glucose loading. If you don't reduce your, if you don't have a GFR of 45, you won't produce sufficient glucose loading. Uh, 
role of uh, uh, opinion of SGLT2 inhibitors in decompensated liver um, disease. Uh, currently, we wouldn't use them simply because there is very little evidence uh, around their use in decompensated liver disease. Now, remember, one of the side effects that you can have with an SGLT2 inhibitor is uh, euglycemic ketosis, particularly when that is set in the context of a catabolic situation of diabetes. Uh, if you have somebody with decompensated liver disease and they have diabetes, really the only management there is insulin. So personally, I would not be using an SGLT2 inhibitor in the context of decompensated liver disease. In Dapa's EKD, only 17% of Asians and blacks, around 7%. So how do you see the usefulness in these people, especially uh, blacks? So in the Dapa's EKD study, you're right, there was relative uh, uh, dearth of uh, ethnic minorities, but within the subgroup analyses from the studies, uh, there did not appear to be any uh, ethnicity differentiation and this is actually also seen indeed in terms of the outcomes uh, across the other SGLT2 inhibitor studies in type 2 diabetes as well. So personally I don't actually see ethnicity being a major issue in terms of influencing SGLT2 inhibitor outcome benefits. Uh, empagliflozin or dapagliflozin, which one better in overall aspect? Well I don't think there are any head-to-head -head studies uh, and I think what you have to do is just look at the evidence base that is accumulating. And I don't really think we need to be worrying about which is the best, but what we really should be doing is thinking about getting uh, more people on an SGLT2 inhibitor per se, be that empagliflozin or dapagliflozin, simply because uh, there is still a huge amount of therapy inertia around the implementation of these agents, as I mentioned at the outset, in terms of routine clinical practice. The uh, upcoming EMPA preserved study has yet to present its data. From what I understand, it's due to be uh, part of an oral presentation at the upcoming AHA or ACC meeting. My thoughts around the EMPA preserved study is that I think it's likely to be positive when you think about the mechanism of action of these drugs, volume depletion, reduction in renin-angiotensin system activity, reduction in cardiac afterload, those sort of features are likely to translate into outcome benefits in people with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, does SGLT2 have evidence for significant reduction of atherosclerosis? Um, so it's not really an atherosclerotic disease modifying agent. The effects of SGLT2 inhibitors really are more mediating around sort of dynamics, energy utilization, uh, and the physiology of sort of kidney disease, heart failure, heart muscle function per se. Uh, I'm sure that through mitigating RAS activation, for example, there will also be an atherosclerotic disease mitigating effect. But largely, many of the outcome benefits and the mechanisms underpinning these are related to functionality at the kidney and cardiac level. Um, when already on diuretics and MRA for heart failure, what precautions should be taken in starting an S? Right, so the precautions when uh, you're already on an SGLT uh, on uh, maximized heart failure is really you just need to be assessing the volume depletion, uh, the volume status of these people as you ordinarily would. So what you may end up doing is actually because symptoms improve being able to reduce down the background dose of frusamide. There is no need for, I think, routine renal safety monitoring, as there was no evidence of an increase, actually, in acute kidney injury when you introduce an SGLT2 inhibitor into people with heart failure. Use of uh, SGLT2 in inappropriate ADH secretion. Good question. Basically, SGLT2 inhibitors do not cause a significant reduction in sodium or potassium levels. So they're basically electrolyte-sparing drugs. So there really shouldn't be a, um, a, a contraindication for the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor in this uh, particular context. Uh, use of SGLT2 inhibitors along with Arnie. Uh, have any added advantages in heart failure reduction. So the interesting thing about this is that the outcome benefits are seen on top of uh, those 
seen with RNEs, etc. So in subgroup analyses, particularly from both DAPA HF and the Emperor Reduced, when you looked at people who were on an RNE or who were not on an RNE, there was still benefit seen by the introduction or addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor. So the outcome benefits that we've talked about with respect to heart failure and cardiovascular death are on top of background therapy. Dare study with dapagliflozin uh, COVID-19 in, uh, uh, showed benefits in 2DM with COVID-19. So interestingly, what this study actually did show was not a significant benefit per se across COVID-19, but it showed that the drugs were safe, but there were subgroups where there was a tendency towards benefit, namely those that established kidney disease and heart failure. And that could, in fact, be a, uh, uh, a feature of the SGLT2 inhibitor effects on heart failure and kidney disease physiology in people with type 2 diabetes. So uh, while there was no evidence actually of uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor doing harm, there was a tendency to trend towards potential benefit, largely driven by the heart failure and the CKD subgroups within the DARE-19 study. Is it a class effect uh, in COVID-19? Most probably, I would say. So we are now up to quarter past four UK time. No more questions? So I hope you've enjoyed this session, this webinar, focusing on SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetes and beyond. It certainly seemed to have sparked quite a lot of interest and discussion, uh, and I do hope that this will form part uh, and just be a sign of things to come in terms of the ongoing mentor and mentee program. So if that is it, shall we uh, call it a day? I hope you've... Thank you, Dr. Mark. Yes, um, well, I, it was fantastic. So, yeah, so thank I you very you much. I enjoyed it, uh, and uh, I look forward to the uh, this year's program. Thank you. Thank you.